crop from the earth, being patient with it until it receives the early and late rains. You also must be patient, strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Beloved, do not grumble against one another, so that you may not be judged. See the judge is standing at the doors. As an example of suffering and patience, beloved, take a prophet who spoke in the name of the Lord. Indeed, we called indeed we called blessed those who showed endurance. You have heard of the endurance of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord. Now the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Above all, my beloved, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Are you among you suffering? They should pray. Are they cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are they among the sick? They should call the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of the faithful will... Uh, Save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sin will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another, so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man being like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. For three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave, uh, gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back to another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from the death that will cover a multitude of sins. The word of God for the people of God. Now this is a shirt sleeve uh, disciple. He's a brother of Jesus. He, he lays it out there in common man's language. He's talking to the Jews who are dispersed. He's not talking to Jews in Jerusalem. He's talking to Jewish Christians. The necessity of patience, and what I find interesting is this isn't like be patient. He's, it's a command. Be patient. Uh, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord, behold, the farmer waits for uh, precise product of the soil being patient about it until it gets the early and late rains when James tells about patience you should be expected to use the present tense he's not using present tense he is continually being patient so in the Greek in the, in the Bible when you look at it it's continually being patient why would we have to be patient well it's been what 2,200 years since Jesus died on the cross uh, we, we, when's he coming back? Now, they believed uh, that he was coming back then. And so, uh, you know, they were probably under persecution. And so endurance was an important thing. But here we are, 2,200 years later, still have to be patient and wait on the Lord. Uh, Someone said to me, well, it's great comfort to be a Christian. I don't know about that. I don't know if it's comfort. It's uh, an enduring comfort. It, it takes, uh, it takes uh, a mindset, uh, 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 steady knees. It takes uh, stepping outside of this world and, and praying for those who, who hurt you. Uh, it's a whole different way of life than what's around us, is what's norm in society. So uh, we're called upon to be like this, to receive a kingdom in heaven that we've never seen. Uh, it's all, uh, blessed are those who believe, who have not seen, that's us. This tells us something about Christian view of patience. Christian patience has a goal in sight. Uh, behold, the farmer waits for the crop and the seasons. There's two seasons, the rainy season and the other season. The farmer pictured here is not a common day labor. This is a, a landowner. Uh, this is a, he is a man who, whose life invested in the fruits of his labor. What he labors is what produces his income. 
then he waits and he waits and he waits some more. And for a long time, nothing happens. The fruit will not come until a long time has passed. And I think about this pandemic. <laughs> How's your patience? <laughs> I think about that. I was reading an article about the workforce. You know, 8 million people out of work and 8 million jobs out there. Why, why don't they hook up? I don't know. You know, patience. I look at the economy, patience. I look at the, uh, uh, the border crisis, patience. I look at the divide and political divide in our country, patience. I look at the, the lack of people going to church in, in the current generations, you know, the 30-year-olds, the 20-year-olds, the 40-year-olds. They just, they don't, they don't see the need for God, patience. Uh, this was a familiar picture for Jewish people to think of a farmer. The Old Testament used an early and late rain is a picture of blessing of God. So you got an early rain, you get two crops, right? Perhaps you're going through one of those dry seasons. Maybe as you think about uh, what you're going through right now, I'm going through cancer. Uh, that certainly has changed my perspective on a lot of things, you know. I get up in the morning and, and uh, I, I can look out at, at the sunrise and I look out the beauty and the birds and I have a whole different perspective, you know. It's just, it's a beautiful thing. What's the reward for patience? You too be patient, strengthen your hearts for the coming Lord is at hand. They believed he was coming now. We, I don't know when he's coming. I, I, how many of you... Oh, you grew up in Pittsburgh, remember back in the day, the guy down there was down the street and Christ is coming and, you know, how many, how many of you, in New York, there was a guy and he's coming, they gave a, di a date and a time, you know. Well, we don't know when he's coming. That's false preaching. People have hope. I remember a woman back in uh, my church, she went on borrowed $40,000. I said, what? And she said, and then she had trouble paying it back. And I said, what'd you do? She said, well, I was listening to the evangelist on TV, the Lord's coming. I thought I might as well enjoy my, my last days. <laughs> How do you master the quality of patience? It's going to be a source. The source is given to passage. The source of passage is that the eventual reward, how you manage the patience, is you look for the hope of what's coming. As Christians, we need to live a light of return Christ. In doing so, there are two possible extremes. The first extreme is the view that Christ is going to be so close that it makes no plans for the future. That's not a good idea. Uh, the same sort of thinking in the early church eventually led some people to quitting their jobs in the early church. Uh, this was happened in my lifetime. After a while, I forget that he's coming at all. That's the other thing. Uh, I forget that I go to church and, and I don't see anything in my life that says I need Jesus. My life's fine. I don't see anything in my life that, that says uh, I need uh, a future. An example, brother, of suffering and patience, take the prophet who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, he count those blessings who endured. You have heard the evidence of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings. The Lord is full of compassion and full of mercy. Uh, I think about Abraham. And uh, Abraham wanted a son and God gave him a son. And then God... I love God. He's so, hey, what a sense of humor. So then he says to Abraham, I gave you this boy. I want you to take him up in a mountain and kill him. I want you to sacrifice him. And Abraham says, okay. And he says, tells his son, let's get the donkey, grab that bundle of sticks. We're going up in the mountain. What are we going to do up here, Dad? Well, we're going to sacrifice you because God wants you as a sacrifice. He gets up there and he and the, the, one of the rabbinical stories is that the boy said, tie the knot tight so I don't want to break free. Uh, and he puts him on the altar. And then the, the ram in the thicket. God didn't want his son. God wanted Abraham. The, 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 the thing that the, the really to grab hold of in these stories in the Old Testament is that God wants you. He wants your obedience you know, the patience uh, to endure what you have to endure. When you, when, you th when you go through suffering, when you go through trials, cancer or loss of a job or uh, coronavirus, in the middle of it, it's painful, it's difficult, and you cry out to God, please take this away. 
Uh, I've seen a few cases where he's done that, but most of the time you walk, have to walk through it, don't you? It takes great patience. Well, when I was a little boy, uh, my grandmother's home, everybody that died came to our house to die. My, my aunt came to, my uncle came to my house. Uh, you know, they all came to our house, and that was the way, that was the nursing home back in the day, you know. And I remember when Grandma died, uh, she came to my mother's house. Well, they didn't come to my house. They came to Grandma's house to die, excuse me. And so I learned a lot of life lessons, you know. Scotty, go up there, and you've got to give him a bath. Go and take his medicine, you know. Go, and, go do this and go do that. And my aunt, who had cancer, you know, the throat, it was a horrible death. My grandfather, I remember, pneumonia. I don't, know, I don't know if we do kids a favor by not having them see death, not having them see the end of life. Uh, I think it's a blessing to see that. It's made my walk in life uh, a reality of it's okay, you know, uh, to suffer. It's okay. Uh, God has a plan in that suffering. I don't, you know, you say, well, what's his plan? Endurance. And, and you know, we, we are so weak need that we need endurance sometimes. If we were like uh, Elijah or like uh, Enoch and just walk up into heaven, we're not like that. Even Moses, the great Moses, had doubts and he went against the Lord. And the Lord said, hey, you're not going to the promised land. Every sin we commit produces a consequence. I didn't get cancer because I didn't sin. I got cancer because of sin. There's no question in my little brain that's where it came from. It's not because I was a good guy or a bad guy. It's just that's the life lesson. And you're going to have to walk through that. Now, I, I of course, pray, Lord, uh, take this away from me. Uh, I, I, would, I would like him to think good of me that what I'm doing here and what we're doing here is worthy to him and that he wants to keep me here. Hey, if he wants to take me home tomorrow, take me home. Someone else will be here. You know, he doesn't need Scott. I need him. That, that's the life reality I learned as a little kid and I learned now. We, we count those blessings who endure. And I think, I think the thing that sentence was so meaningful to me as a child. When I see people on their deathbed and they endure that pain, my aunt, and she gave a blessing to God in her death. Do we bless God in life and death? And, and the, one, the one passage I want to talk about of the promise. We are people but above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear either by heaven or earth or any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under judgment. One of the areas in which Christians are called to endure is keeping their word. Your word should be good. You don't need to make an oath, just make your word good. This can be best understood when compared to the parable in Matthew's account on the Sermon on the Mount. You will recall that I have suggested this is an entire epistle as a commentary in the sermon that James is the Sermon on the Mount. Again, you have heard the ancients are told, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven or the throne of God, or by earth, or for its footstool of the feet, or by Jerusalem, for the city of great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, or your, you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your statement be yes, yes, and your no be no. How many of us have made a pledge to marry and have broke their promise? That's a shame. How many of us have, have made pledges to our children and didn't keep those promises? Now, I'm, I tend to be a promise keeper. I say, you know, you're going to get spanked if you do that one more time. And, and, and Charlie would say to Krista, he means it. <laughs> and that ended it. <laughs> you know, when I put that first boy in the sack in seventh grade, everything else straightened right out, I'm telling you. <laughs> I want you to notice from the onset that what he's saying is, is you don't have to make a promise. But we, we do make promises when we get married. 
We do make promises when we join the church. We do make promises when we become a minister. And the, the most faithful thing I can do is to be honest and be upright. You know? That, that God is a promise keeper, and we are God's children, and we should be like him in keeping those promises. Now, you know, I've gone back. I, I look at my sins. I've counted my, listen, last week I made a list. I'm on page 947, you know. I've sinned, <laughs> and I've broken promises. I'm not saying we're, uh, uh, there's no perfect people going to heaven. There's forgiven sinners. Christians are people of prayer. That's the important thing I want to talk about. According to church tradition, James has a nickname among the believers of the early church. He was known as Old Camel Knees. I love that statement, Old Camel Knees. Have you ever seen the camel of its knees, how baggy they are? Uh, look at the old uh, baggy flesh from being on your knees all the time. I have known that most men's legs are not worth a second look. <laughs> uh, that is why we really... Uh, look at a man's knees and ask him, yeah, is he a prayer? Why is James known as a prayer life? What was the motivation in James' prayer? Well, James had been a disciple in the upper room. James was a brother of Jesus. He grew up with him. He knew him as a kid. James is the one that went to get Jesus with his mother and said, he's nuts, Mom. He needs to come home and rest. He's, he's way out there. And then he goes from that to the upper room. And he goes from that to being a disciple. He goes to that to write an epistle. He goes to that to write an uh, epistle. He goes from that to being uh, uh, outreach to the, the, Jewish, the Jewish Christians who are dispersed. James has been there uh, that night after Peter was in prison in church, gathering the home of John Mark. He, he's a forerunner. He's right there in the middle of it. And his lesson he learned, he teaches us pray. He gives us practical theology. We are patient in prayer. If anyone among you is suffering, let him pray. If anyone's cheerful, let him sing praises. If anyone among you is sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with the oil of the Lord. And the prayer offering in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sin, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed that you may be healed. That's a powerful witness. And I, 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 I studied, uh, I took a course in seminary years ago on healing. I had a guy come in and he was a healer. And I've looked at my ministry and I've talked to you about various healings and various things I've seen. But I, I can tell you that we are in Jesus. No one's going to touch my robe and be healed. I have no power to heal. God has power to heal. Now, if he uses a prayer, or he uses me, or he uses whatever, he, he uses people. And James is saying that call on the, the elders of the church to come anoint you, then do that if you're sick. And, and then pray and, and confess your sins. I'm on page uh, 1720, and my I just added to it just in the... This is the last half hour. It was easy. I just tally them up, all my sins. <laughs> Faithfulness to God is obedience to God. Now, I, I love the prayer that people make. I'm being mocking here. They throw a name out. Pray for Bob. Why? Well, I'm, what am I praying for Bob for? Why am I praying for this, these, this woman or this man or this situation? I'm wasting my breath and I'm wasting the church's time if I don't have a prayer. My faith and my prayers go hand in hand. Faith without works is dead. If I'm praying for Bob and I'm praying for his recovery, what have I done about Bob and his recovery? What have I seen in Bob's life? What am I praying for? Is he in recovery? No, he's just drinking. I'm supporting it. Well, then don't pray for him. Pray for yourself that you get enough backbone to tell them. You see, our prayers are, have to be specific. And, in the, and it, what he's saying is, pray for what you need and tell God, tell him exactly what you need. You've got to be specific. I, I need this situation changed. How do you want to change? Blah, 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 blah. What are you doing about it? 
blah, 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 blah. I'm not just throwing it out there. I'm not throwing money at people and saying, here, here's a hundred bucks, go be well. well what's the hundred dollars for? What are you going to do with it? Are you going to give it to your girlfriend for drugs? Or are you going to, uh, is that guy, uh, I, I was uh, driving down the street and I, I went and I, uh, people, these two couple were over there and they were dancing around. They looked, oh, they looked, you may say it's single. And I, I went on to my hearing doctor and I got there and uh, I got, I prayed about them and I thought, well, they'll be fine, you know. And God said, no. And I, and I went back and th there they were. And, and they were, you know, uh, dancing, and they were kissing, and, and, you know, you could tell they were in love. And I said, okay. And I turned around went back to um, Bo uh, some place that has chicken. We got a big thing of chicken, iced tea, and french fries, and everything came in. And I drove up. They were still there at the park. This, now, I started out at 1 o'clock, and it was now 8 o'clock. That's how long Scott, before I kind of got through my head, I was going to do something. And I took them this chicken and biscuits and some french fries. And I stopped and I rolled down and said, hey, stop that kissing. Come over here and some, some food. Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We've been praying for some food today. We haven't eaten in three days. We want to thank you. Oh, God is so good to us. If I, if I, if I hadn't turned around, if I hadn't spent six hours Panging over what, you know, the lesson, the life lesson was God was telling me to do something for this couple. Food. Not give them money. Not give them what I don't have. Not give them something that, I don't know if they do drug addicts. I don't know why they're there. But I knew that they ate that day, right? That's what was important. I've told that story before. Do you, when you pray for something, do you want it to happen? Do you want, do you want recovery? You want uh, this cancer removed? You want your hearing restored? You want that t tumor gone? Do something about it. That's why they have doctors. And then the prayer goes hand in hand with that. 90% perspiration, 10% inspiration. But God's not going to heal you if you don't want it and you don't believe it. Don't be double-minded about your prayer. I know God is good. I'm asking him to heal me. I've asked him to heal Pam. I've asked him to heal uh, several people. And he's healed some. But I know I'm in his hands. And I know what I'm asking for. And I'm doing, stepping out and saying, tell me what to do next. Tell me what to do next. And if I go through pain and suffering, that'll be for my benefit. It'll be not for not. It'll be for my benefit. Whatever he has in mind for me, uh, the can he didn't produce the cancer. I did. But he, he will help me through this. But that situation, that drug addiction, that, that uh, hearing loss, that cancer, that heart attack, God will use for an opportunity to do what? Help us endure. Why do we want to endure? Because we want patience. What's patience produce, people? Faith, the peace that passes all understanding. I want the peace that passes all understanding. I met a man in uh, Illinois, and I went to visit him, and he said, uh, went to visit his wife, and he said, well, I said, your husband hasn't gone to church. She said, no, he's not coming back. I said, why not? He says, because he's got too much peace. He doesn't need to go back there and fight with those people. <laughs> I said, after I was there about six months, I understood what she was saying. <laughs> I don't know. Love others. You know, that's our, our, here's our mission statement right on the wall. Love others. Pray for them. Love God. Know that he's good and he's, and he's right there with you. Grow deeper in your understanding and give abundantly. Give abundantly in your prayers. It's not, don't give your resources to people that are going to squander them. What's the game plan? You need to know the game plan. You need to know what is it you're after, and you're praying for something specific. Now, last week I concluded with, God doesn't want us to be children. He want us, wants us to be mature in every way. But he wants us to be childlike in respect that we 
are his children and he's the dad and he's got all the answers. That's maturity when you can give it to him and say, hey, tell me today what I'm supposed to do. And then wake up tomorrow and wake up and, you know, I've got a new daily perspective of day by day. I, you know, people said, are you worried? I, what's there to worry about? If I'm here, I'm here. If I'm not, I'm, I'm somewhere else. I know where I'm going. I'm good. <laughs> Jeez, we just skipped like six pages right there. The language of the Old Testament is sacrifice, isn't it? When the blood of the sacrificial animal was sprinkled upon the altar, it was said to be covering and anointing for sin. So when the priest sprinkled the blood, he was anointing it for the sin. We have Jesus who has sprinkled his blood for our sin once and for all time. And as a matter of fact, for Ab Abraham's sin as well, Isaac. We have a sacrifice that's much better than any made in the Old Testament because it endures forever. We have a sacrifice that was made once and for all. It doesn't have to keep going. You don't have to sacrifice a blessed thing. He's done it for us. When you come to the cross, you find a salvation from death and a covering from all sins you've committed. And it is at this point that you are able to reach out and invite others to share in that salvation. And give them a purpose in living of saying, how are you going to recover from that? Well, I, got to, I haven't gotten any money. Okay, great. That's a good starting point. How are you going to get some? Where are you going to give it to me? I said, no, I'm not. But, you know, how are you going to get it? I don't have any to give you. Well, I drove back and got food. I can do that. I don't know. How do you help in their salvation? How do you help them see the need for a Savior and a pathway to get to him? Zachar Zacchaeus got up in a tree, great sinner, tax collector. Jesus came to him, called him out of the tree and said, come on, I'm going home to eat with you. Jesus has come to our house and he has eaten with us. And he has given us the bread of life. He has given us the body uh, of perfection. And praise God, hallelujah, and thank him for that. Oh, here it is. Uh, in the back of the book, please stand for the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.